I said, I can make this stuff go viral. And I said, let's do it. So I started changing all my magic to what you see online now. You know, me pranking cops, doing tricks for the homeless, giving them money, parking pranks, you know, wheelchair pranks and all that. And that, that sent off another, another line to our portfolio performing, you know. So Welcome to Sunny Setup Podcast. I am your host, David. And we have the man, the myth, the legend, Murray Sawchuck. What's up, David? How you doing? I'm doing awesome, man. So this one, good. jump right into it. How long have you been doing magic? Oh, my God. Forever, I feel, you know. Um, I started when I was seven years old back in Vancouver, Canada, where I'm from. You know, I live in Vegas now. <clears throat> I've been here about... I guess 25 years now. I've been in the States about 35. But um, but yeah, I was a kid, got a magic kit like most people do, you know, at their birthday or when you're a kid at some point. I think as a as a guy growing up, you get like a matchbox car set, you get a tool set, you get some trucks, maybe Lego, a magic kit. Those are kind of things you get between the age of what, three and like 13 maybe, you know, <laughs> along with yeah. clothes and socks and stuff you don't really want. But yeah, magic kit kind of came my way and I'd already – danced professionally from the age of five and i played accordion and music just because it's kind of my style you know but yeah so i started as a kid and i you know when i was younger i um you know did the dancing and the music and i did that till like i was 16 years old for about 11 years i liked it my dad played music and and all that stuff uh but then the magic thing because i was already in front of an audience um it really was a cool thing i kind of liked it you know that I already knew something and they didn't, you know, and then also visually from the audience's point of view, it didn't look anything like me, you know, what I was seeing, you know, because obviously I'm trying to hide secrets. So, so yeah, got going on that and I did start doing kids' birthday parties as a young kid. When I was 14 or 15, my dad would drive me to these shows for 50 bucks for like half an hour. And uh, I went to school, I got a degree in radio, television, broadcasting, marketing, um, but I put that aside, you know, cause I was making some money off magic and I thought, well, if this is the way it goes, why not? You know, it's something I love doing. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, don't forget, this is all before like Instagram, Facebook, before, you know, every girl and, and every guy posts every meme about, you know, making your dreams come true. And this is that, and all these meme things we start seeing, you know, yeah. um, there wasn't many things for inspiration, like the memes or the things we all see every two seconds on our social media. Um, it was watching stars on TV, the yeah, old stars, you know, um, probably way before your time, but you know, Liberace and Elvis Presley and Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, all these people my parents grew up with, you know? And, uh, I thought that's, that's pretty cool that they're famous for just being famous and having a talent. So I thought, yeah. well, it's an opportunity for me. So, so yeah, so here I am now at 120 years old in Vegas. No, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I've been doing it a while now. So your first, like your first ever show, how much money did you make from that? My first show, I got paid ten dollars um, for a half an hour birthday party. It was for my aunt and uncle, my uncle Bill and Aunt Eileen. Um, they're still around. They're still back in Canada in their eighties, and uh, it was for their grandkids. And they were very, very dear friends of my mom and dad. They were friends when they were growing up as kids. That's how long they've been friends. And um, I had this magic kit, and they said, well, would Murray like to come and do a half an hour show? And I said, that's amazing. I didn't even ask for money because I didn't think I was that good and anything else. But I thought, you know, let's go do this show. So I had all these little tricks for my magic kit that I had. It has a magic box that was about, oh, I mean, it was, probably had about 75 tricks in it. And, um, and, yeah, and I pulled about half an hour worth of material that I thought I could pull off. I did it, and they sent gave me a thank you card at the end, which I thought was very nice. And um, yeah, and and I had ten dollars inside the card, and I thought, well, that's pretty cool for half an hour. You know, mm -hmm. I was doing a paper route at that time. I was lucky if I was making eight bucks an hour doing the paper route. You know, but um, but yeah, so that's kind of cool. You know, so that's that kind of how I started. And actually, what's funny is now I'm sitting in my office, and I know we're on uh, Zoom, but um, I want to show you. This is my first magic stand I ever had growing up. No way. In a while. Yeah, and this is from like 1989, 1988. So I assume it was before you're born, probably. Um, but, but this is not the actual ones I threw it out. You know, when you're a kid, you don't think about keeping stuff like that because you don't think it, whatever, it's not going to be anything interesting. So I've been looking for about 20 years for a kit like that. 
because I knew that was the one I got and uh, pretty hard to find because, you know, when they make things for a while, it's the end of them. So, so yeah. So anyway, I found one online, so I actually have the whole kit back, which is kind of cool. I never expected me being this successful or, you know, popular in magic or whatever the heck it is. So now, remember, as, as you're growing up, remember, start saving little things. Don't become a horror, but little things that are interesting in your career, you know, save them or something because, you know, when you're my age, you'll realize, man, I wish I would have had that. That really was a big um, opportunity or that was a cool thing I should have kept from somebody, you know, that maybe influenced you or something. So, yeah. Hmm. So That's really cool. <laughs> Still have like that old, you know, the, the first one. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I have my second one too. I found that as well, which is what my Uncle Nant gave me. It was a Siegfried and Roy one. And, uh, and then the rest is history. You know, I got into it and made money and started traveling in my late teens, did cruise ships a lot in my 20s and got got to be good and bad around the world, learning how to, you know, find a brand and find what my style was, you know. Mm -hmm. And here we are in Vegas. Uh, I think it's my 21st year in Vegas now. So, so like from your first show, that one that you said that you made $10, and like I've seen you on, you know, TV and we talked about you being on the show Pawn Stars, like how, how long did it take you to go from that first show to more of like a professional realm? Yeah, you know, I think it was, I, I was faking it till I make it, you know, I think I still am, I think we all are, you know, um, you know, I had these little tricks and then I wanted something more serious, so I, I joined a magic club in, in Vancouver called the Vancouver Magic Circle, so it's kind of like a magic club, you know, like a, a car club, motorcycle club, you know. Mm -hmm. maybe a knitting club grandparents are in I don't know and so we kind of hang out and talk about stuff so I realized uh, these guys gave me some insight where the magic shops were in Vancouver you know and don't forget this is before the internet you couldn't just go on Amazon and order stuff or go on Google and figure out how a trick worked you know because that, that just wasn't there you had to go to a library and get a book out you know um, or old books that people had that's really the, the only way or have somebody show you in person like somebody who's really professional so throughout the time, I had a mentor in magic. His name was Mr. Electric. And he went by the name Marvin Roy. And uh, he lit light bulbs in the palms of his hand um, for over 50 years. Took a light bulb. And remember, in the early 1900s, light bulbs were just invented. So here in the late 40s and 50s, he's taking a light bulb out of a lamp, putting it in your hand, and lighting it up. You know, nowadays, with batteries and what we can do, maybe it's not as amazing because we can have a small battery power or something, right, because of our technology. But back then... You know, we never had batteries that did that, so it was pretty phenomenal. And his book, I, what's funny is I have his book right here. He's passed away about five years ago, but his, that's Mr. Electric right there, Unplugged. And that's a uh, pretty phenomenal book. You know, he worked with everybody in the business, from Dean Martin, Fred Astaire, Frank Sinatra, and him and his wife were very, very famous. So he taught me, if you want to get ahead somewhere in life, be different. You know, don't just go with the norm. You know, and I've always been a bit odd or different, you know. Um whether the way I look with my hair, my glasses, uh, even the tricks I do, you know, a lot of times, if you notice, I'll perform the videos, I'll perform, of course, I'll do them with cops or police officer parking attendants, so I get a, a reaction out of that because it's should, something you shouldn't do. Mm -hmm. um, and then magic, my style isn't just to do a trick. I'll do a trick, it'll mess up and go wrong, you know, a very Dennis the Menace, very, you know, very haphazardly, and then it'll work out, you know, because I think that's just funny when people think things go wrong, as long as you can act it out or make sure, make them believe it really did go wrong, you know, and, yeah. um, and yeah, so that's kind of my style, with the brand, with the hair and the glasses and all other stuff, so, but as I kept going along, though, with your question, is I asked people, I kept trying to get bigger shows, so I got a bigger agent that would book adult shows, so mainly my, my work as a teenager was kids parties, because it was easy, and and you could do half an hour. At that point, I was starting to do kids' parties for like half an hour for $125 and 150 maybe at Christmas, 250 you know. And I made a lot of money in, during the Christmas season doing office parties and stuff, you know, holiday parties. But then I get that odd one show for a corporation, you know, at a big hotel in Vancouver. And for five or $700, which is a lot of money for somebody who's 16 or 17. So I'd have to do more adult magic. You know, I have to figure out something that's really amazing. You know, borrow somebody's money and put it inside a fruit or you know have people pick some stuff and then guess their names you know stuff that really adults would find amazing and i got enough material and then when i was 19 20 i got an offer to go on a cruise ship which is adult and i got the phone call and they said hey i got a job for you it's 1100 dollars a week and this is like back in 1992 or three so there's a lot of money 1100 dollars a week and i was canadian so uh 1100 it was 1100 american 
And in Canada at that time, the exchange rate like it is now wasn't the greatest. So $1,100 American was like $1,800 Canadian. So at 20 years old, that's a lot of money, you know, a week. So I said, yeah, I'll take the job. And they said, well, you need two different 45-minute shows, different. And then you need 10 or 15 minutes on top of that different. And honest to God, I only had probably 45 minutes of any material. But I said, oh, yeah, of course, I got it. No problem. It'll be easy. And, uh, and this is on a Tuesday. And then they said, great. I said, so when's the gig? I'm assuming two, three, four weeks away. And they said, this Friday. And I went, oh, wow. All right. So I said, great. No problem. I got it. So I just bullshitted my way through all that, hung up the phone. And then I called local magic shops uh, through a catalog I had. Because once again, remember, the Internet's not around now. So we had these big books, catalogs, like, you know, in the old days, you know, you'd look through a catalog. And I'd phone them up, order some stuff. And I ordered it to New York because that's where my ship was going to be out of. So I had enough material to do the half an hour cruise from Montreal, Canada to New York, but I didn't have any material to go back. So I picked up everything in New York City, new magic, and I spent three days with no sleep on the cruise ship learning how these tricks worked. And I put together my another 45 minute show, which I never had on the way back for the new passengers. So, so yeah, so I learned really quickly. I bullshit a lot, but I also, you know, stepped up to the plate and, and made it work. You know, I'm not, I don't know if the show was that great, but it was good enough to kept me on the ship for like five contracts and seven months, seven and a half months I spent there. So, wow. Yeah. I liked you. I mean, they, they kept you on that long, right? Yeah. I, I was nice enough and I was pleasant and kind and my ego wasn't in the way. And I also realized how lucky I was to be in that position, you know, and one thing I've realized also, you know, in life, everyone's replaceable. I don't care how great you are. You know what I mean? It could be Tony Hawk on a skateboard. It could be Bruno Mars in a microphone or Lady Gaga or Machine Gun Kelly or whatever. There's always somebody else at that level that can replace them, you know. So you got to be nice to people and put your ego in check and, and realize how lucky we all are, you know. Mm -hmm. So after like after that, when you got on the, the cruise ship, what was your what was your career like after that? Like how did how did you become who you are now from that point? Well, you know, I did the cruise ships and I really got got to be bad in on ships, you know, and I was still good. But I got, you know, they're not buying a ticket to see me there. They're buying a ticket for a cruise and the entertainment's a bonus, you know, on cruise ships. So it's not like they bought a hundred dollar ticket going, oh, this guy sucks. I want my hundred bucks back. You know, they're getting the cruise, the free food. They're seeing the world. So it's nice. You can kind of, there's a little bit of room for play, at least back then. And so um, I kept looking at the next thing because I realized television was the way to go. And I thought I needed to, to get on TV. So I kept doing different things and trying to be different. And then I started messing my hair up more and making it look like this. So I stood out more and I wasn't just, you know, a decent looking kid that did some good tricks. And I started making fun of myself and making fun of the magic I was doing. And then I started applying for TV shows. I would write letters and send headshots and send big VHS tapes, you know, those things of the past. Now, I think that's all we had. And the odd time I'd get, some information back and then and then i um got an opportunity i moved to the orlando florida when i was married to my first wife this is years ago in 1999 and got me into the states and and we were too young to get married but so it fell apart but we're still friends now but she was a singer and i was a magician i lived in orlando so it was a good place to be for the ships and for traveling and uh, i thought well i'd love to go to vegas or la because that's really where things are happening and as a magician vegas is kind of the place to be so i started mailing letters and and resumes and all this stuff, a few things that I did. And I'd won a lot of awards at that point in the magic world because that was a nice way to, you know, show my worth somehow. And, uh, and it worked out, and I got this offer for Vegas, and I thought, let's go. You know, unfortunately, at the time, my relationship was falling apart. So, you know, we got divorced, and I moved out here. I didn't have any kids or anything. I just had to separate a few things, a house, the car or two. And uh, I came out here, you know, and I, I gave it a shot at the Frontier Hotel. I opened January 26, 2002. And uh, and that was that changed everything. And of course, I forced me to be more professional and step up to the Vegas game, you know, which in Vegas, you have the best of the best here. And at that point, reality TV was coming around uh, from Blind Date, which is an old, old, old show to at the time the Osbournes were on TV, which is, you know, that's how the Kardashians became the Kardashians of the Osbournes. They were the first family reality show on TV back then, you know. And so I started auditioning for reality TV. I thought, man, there's a great avenue to get on. You don't need to be Johnny Depp or Leonardo DiCaprio or, you know, anybody really amazing at acting. Get on. You can just be an idiot like me, and I can do that. So I uh, I started applying for stuff like that, and it seemed to really suit my 
genre, not many people who did magic were going on reality. They, they thought it wasn't the greatest thing. And I thought, well, it's working. It's sticking around. It's an excuse to get on TV. So that's kind of how that all started. And I never looked back. And that's where my popularity rose. You know, and then also once YouTube came around and in 2015, when social media and YouTube really started kicking in, I met this producer, Seth Leach, who's a very dear friend of mine now. Well, he's like a brother to me, you know, and um, and he said, hey, I love your stuff, uh, but no one's watching it. <laughs> it was a backhanded compliment. And I said, well, what are we doing? You want to help me? And he says, yeah. I said, I can make this stuff go viral. And I said, let's do it. So I started changing all my magic to what you see online now, you know, me pranking cops doing tricks for the homeless, giving them money, parking pranks, you know, wheelchair pranks and all that. And that, that sent off another, another line to our portfolio of performing, you know, so kind of like always reinventing the wheel, looking for that next thing, you know, that keeps you on top or it's different, you know, mm -hmm. I love your self depreciating so, sense of humor. <laughs> thanks. You have to be, I love being funny. I love comedians, you know, and I think you really have to, you know, be honest with yourself, you know, and who you are. Don't take yourself too seriously. I think in this day and age, unfortunately, we're being canceled here, canceled there, censorship. And it doesn't matter what you say, you offend somebody. And yes, there's certain things that happen and do that aren't right and that aren't cool and that shouldn't be said or done. But then there's other things where you sit back and go relax. You know, we're all human. We're only here for about 80 years on, the, on, on you know, this earth. Let's all get along. Let's not be mean to each other, you know what I mean? Let's have some respect, you know, and let's have a laugh at each other because we're all weird looking, you know, and funny and <laughs> just do weird things, you know, so. It was like you said when you're on the, the cruise ship, like you, you couldn't let your ego take over and, you know, because that would kind of ruin the experience. And I, I mean, I would assume that for somebody in the entertainment business like yourself, like you can't let your ego get ahead of you because, I mean, that's... No. And it happens a lot. I see it all the time, you know, or when people are super, super famous, they just feel like they, you know, they're untouchable. And yeah, you feel that way because you're making money and people are, you're paying them to say yes to you. You know what I mean? So, because you're paying the bills. So if I'm, if you're working for me, I go, this is, this is a good idea, isn't it? Well, you're going to say yes. You're not going to go, actually, that's a crappy idea. You know, I'm your boss. I'm paying you. So how are you going to, unless you really know me well, like a best friend or something, they can get away with it, you know? But my, my workers who work with me and that, and they know they can get away with it because I want the honest truth. I don't want somebody bullying me. You know, I want you to say, yeah, it kind of looks, you know, how does the suit look? Yeah, it doesn't look very good. Great. I can handle that. I'm not, I don't care. You know, so I'd rather that happen than me being on TV going, why didn't somebody tell me that? You know, uh, but a lot of stars and people just don't have that situation. You know, people always talk about Michael Jackson dying and all the drugs he was taking. Well, you know, and the doctors that prescribed it to him. Well, if the doctor said no to him, he just go to another doctor. He was that famous and that rich, you know, people don't understand that, you know, if the doctor said, no, I'm not. He just go, great. Thanks. Go somewhere else. So, you know, mm -hmm. it's my opinion, but that's when you're at that level and that famous people or yes, people around you, you know, Britney Spears have the same thing and a lot of people have that, you know, but there's also the real people that can go, Hey, stop. That's not cool. I wouldn't do this. Go ahead and do it. But I'm just gotta let you know, I take a second to think about that, you know, and that goes a long way. Absolutely, one hundred percent. Yeah. So, how many how many different shows have you been on? That's a great question. I was trying to figure that out a while ago. If you I mean, it's definitely know. over a hundred. You know, uh, TV shows and streaming shows and everything else. I mean, you add podcasts in there and YouTube videos and that. You know, it's got to be, you know, a lot. You know, mm -hmm. um, I've been very fortunate to find my niche. You know, and what people like and what people. Um, are entertained by, I think, you know, and I love waking up in the morning doing stuff like this with you. You know, I love meeting new people. I'm, you know, and the older you get, I think it's important to not be so jaded, not be so pigeonholing yourself into what you like and what you don't like to be all do. As you get older, you kind of don't like change. You kind of like, this is my world. I'm living it. It's working out for me. Lovely. And the older you get, you get like that. And you miss out some really cool opportunities, you know, or meeting younger people or things that are, you know, things that are amazing now. You know, or even music that's coming out now, you know, I, I'll listen to it and I'll try to make myself like certain things because that's what's trendy now. You know, why can't I like it? You know, just because it wasn't the music I grew up on when I was a teenager or in my 20s, you know, it's still great music, you know. So I really try to open my mind up to not being that jaded person and not being judgy, you know, which is easy to do as you get older, you know. Yeah. So I want to thank the man with the amazing hair. For his time and thank you again for coming on
You're very welcome, David. Thanks for having me on your podcast, uh, Sunny Side Up. And uh, anytime you're in Las Vegas, you're always a guest at my show. You and your family, and let me know and uh, come check out my show sometime. Okay. So, where can the people find you on social media? You can find me at Murray Saw Chuck, which is my name, Saw and Chuck, S A W C H U C K. Or I'm Murray the Magician. Uh, I put it on Google. You'll probably see more than you want to. You know, I'm currently at Tropicana here in Las Vegas. Been there almost about 10 years. Um, and I'm still on TV, Pawn Stars, Master of Illusion on CW. And uh, check out my website, murraymagic.com. You see all the touring stuff I'm doing. If I'm coming to a city near you, come and hang out. Okay. So thanks, thanks David. So you don't miss any more future videos. And I'll see you next time.